And so I'm going to open up with our, our opening verse of Scripture today, which is 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go to another portion of Scripture. And today, last week we talked about um, marriage relationships, and today we're going to be talking about family, uh, relationships of family. And uh, 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. All right, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you that uh, you are love. God is love, the Bible says. And Lord, we just desire to be able to love the way you taught us to love. So God, continue to lead us and guide us by your spirit and speak to our hearts today. And just challenge us again, Lord. We, need, we always need to be challenged. And so we're asking you once more, challenge us, Father. We thank you and we praise you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we opened up, we talked a little bit about 1 Corinthians 13. And then we went to 1 John 3. We did James chapter 1, where James tells us not to be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. And it's so easy for us to, to hear the word and to, to be able to say it and think we've done it. Uh, but th that's not doing the word. That's just hearing the word. And he wants to make us doers of the word. And so we talked about, you know, specifically for husbands is who we were, were pointing at last week. And that seems to be where we're aiming, you know, a lot lately. But uh, the Bible told husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And we talked about how that word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's, it's a title. Christ means Messiah. And as Messiah, we said there's many things that Jesus is as Messiah. And we, we just picked out three of them. Three of the things that Jesus is because he's Messiah. One of those is prophet. Moses said that God is going to raise up another prophet for you among you, just like me. And Jesus is that prophet. And so, men, we need to be the prophet in the homes. We need to be the one that's speaking the word of God in the home. That's what he's called us to be. The prophet speaks God's word. And that's what you're called to do in your home. The other thing that it says is that, David wrote in Psalm 110 that, that he would be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And so he's prophet. He speaks the word of God. And so he's priest. He's, that in, he's the one that goes between you and, and the Lord. And he's that one. And we, we focus in on prayer. Husbands, pray with your wives. Pray with your families. And we just saw how hard that is to do. It's such a hard thing to do. But don't be doers of the word. I mean, don't be, <laughs> yeah, be doers of the word. Don't be hearers of the word only. Be doers of the word. Yeah, that's right. Lord, help me preach. You know how you oftentimes get mixed up. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one that's not mixed up, I think. And then the last thing we saw, there's that, that name Melchizedek means my king is righteous or king of righteousness. And that Jesus is coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And as king, you're the one that's supposed to be in your family. You're the one that's supposed to provide for your family. You're the one that's supposed to be protecting your family. Um, and these are just three of the things that we looked at, that, that God has called us to be and to do, uh, especially us men in the church of Jesus Christ and, and, and with our wives. And then, and, then, and then that actually goes into our families as well, and we're going to look at that today. And I wanted to read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, uh, to just start, start us off this morning. And, and this is what Moses wrote for us. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. That you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. That you may fear the Lord your God. And then this is what he says. You and your son and your son's son. So he's talking about family. And he's talking about the progression of the family. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life. And that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them. That it may go well with you. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And then this is what he tells us to do. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so 
he's really being very uh, specific here about how he wants us to be with our families. He said that we are to teach diligently to our children and, and talk about the commandments of God when we sit at home, when we walk, uh, and when we sit in our house, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise up. In other words, all the time. Always have that in the forefront. You know, the, the Lord Jesus Christ and God. See, family is all about growth. It's all about uh, nurturing, growing, maturing. You know, and, and as many of us here are parents and uh, most of us had parents. Thank you. Somebody, somebody got it. <clears throat> uh, we all know that that isn't that the goal with family. We want to see our families grow. We want to see them mature. And, um, and someday they're going to move out on their own, aren't they? And, and we want to prepare them for that. And, you know, there's many ways that we can prepare them. You know, I was listening to K-Love not too long ago. And, and I hope I don't offend anybody by this, but uh, I was listening to, that I listened to Caleb. No, that's not what I meant, but it's what, what just happened. They, 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 they asked a question to, they took a poll, and I don't know if it was with millennials. I think it might have been with millennials. And they polled them, and they said, how many of you think that you should force your children to go to church? And they said, 85% of them said, no, I would not do that. 85% said, no, you should not force your children to go to church. And I just thought to myself, okay. Let's, let's just think here for a minute. Let's, uh, how many of us would say, how many of you should force your children to go to school? Do you think 85% of them would say, no, I, no, we, we let our kids choose whether they want to go to school or not. So what's more important, reading, writing, and arithmetic? Or uh, the way, the truth, and the life? And it's just amazing. You know, we, we, we set these things aside, what we wouldn't do with the worldly aspect of things. And God wants us to, to do what, what we just read, you know, to teach diligently to our children the things of God. Talk about them when you sit in your home, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You know, letting go is part of this. Letting go is a difficult part of parenting. Um, just the other day, I, I, I saw how, how this takes place. I had little Anna in my arms. Don't you just love little Anna? And Ada was walking with me, and I gave a piece of candy to Ada. And Ada immediately said, Pepe, open this for me. And I said, okay. I opened it for Ada, and I gave it to her. And I said, Anna, Anna do you want Pepe to open it for you? No, me do. See, she wanted to do it on her own. And, and that, that's what we're, we're aiming at our kids to do it on their own, right? And the only, the only time she stopped was when she finally realized she couldn't do it on her own. She said, Pepe, you do. <laughs> but, you know, right from the very beginning, they want to do things on their own. And we want to train them, don't we? We want to teach them to be able to do things on their own. And we want to, you know, we also want to allow them to make mistakes, don't we? You had to let Anna try to do it herself at first. She couldn't figure it out. And I could have taught her there, but I didn't. I just opened it up and gave it to her. <laughs> but, I mean, that, that's part of the process. And, and I think that the, the time that we feel letting go the, the, the most, though, um, is that, that first time that your child, uh, they take that test, they pass that driver's test, and you give them the keys to the car. And they get in the car for the very first time all alone. And no one else is in the car with them. Wow, that, that's just part, the hard parts of, of parenting. And what are we trusting in at that moment? Well, we're trusting in what we've taught our kids, aren't we? We're trusting that we have been diligent to, 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 to implant within them. And, and that's really, you know, what it's all about. And because and, and the, 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 even scarier than going out in a car all alone is going into a world... A, a dark world. See, that's the, the, the darkness is out there. That's where the darkness is. It's in the world. And that's where they're going. It's much more scary to me that 
that they're going into a dark world without me there to hold their hand than that they're getting in a car and driving off alone. Although that is, again, that's scary. That's but so, so the, the way that we need to be do that after we let go, the, the most important part of our, our job as parents is, is trusting God and teaching our children to trust in God. I want to read a verse of scripture here because I want to I want to tell a little story here in a second. I want to read a little story. Uh, Matthew five verses fourteen and fifteen says, "You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house." So you know you don't light a lamp and put it under uh, under a basket or you put it on its stand, and what does it do? It gives light into all the house. So uh, Mark Weinrich told this story, uh, this true story that happened to him one day. He wrote, every fall, with the first chill of frost, animals seek refuge in warm places. And one fall evening, our family returned home after dark. We hadn't turned the porch light on because we expected to return earlier. And I opened the front door and flipped on the light. And my wife screamed, what's that? I glanced down as a 13-inch rattlesnake slithered off the door sill and through the open door. There was no time to react. There was no time to slam the door. Whose house is it now? He says, what could I do? A rattlesnake can be a disturbing creature anytime, even if it's a small one. But what happens when he invites himself into your home? I edged the door further and opened and peeked inside, and the rattler coiled and buzzed. What volume? The snake's warning magnified, echoing in the confines of the entryway. And he says, the rattlesnake captured my attention, backing and buzzing his way under the dark space of the entry area closet door. There's not much on that closet floor, so I could imagine the snake crawling into the vacuum cleaner. My sl son slid behind me and ran into the kitchen, and I yelled, Matt, bring me the broom. No, this isn't Ken, by the way. <clears throat> All right. Broom in hand, I jerked the door open and swept the snake into the hall. And then I opened the front door, swept the furious rattler onto the porch, and pinned him with the broom. And Matt brought the garden home, and I dispatched the intruder. And then he wrote this. He says, later, I meditated on the ordeal and realized the snake had not invited himself in. I had let him in. If I'd left the porch light on, he'd have found another warm, dark place to sleep. I, the father, the head of the household, had let the serpent in. I wondered, had I let other harmful things enter our home? What a startling question. As startling as the rattler's buzz, I didn't ma it didn't matter whether it was intentional or not. Had I introduced or allowed harmful things into our home? He writes, Christian fathers should be the light of their families just as Christ is to them. Does my devotional life with the Lord have the intensity to guide, help, and pr protect my family through their physical and spiritual growth? The rattlesnake incident caused me to reevaluate my time in prayer and in God's word. By God's grace and wisdom, my light is shining a little better now. And the porch light is shining too. One great sweep of light chasing darkness and intruders from our path and our home. He, called, he titled that little devotional, Fathers Keep the Lights On. Keep the lights on. But he asked a question. He said, had I introduced or allowed harmful things into our home? You know, it's impossible for us to, to stop 
all harmful things from entering our home, especially in the day and age in which we live in? Because if we're going to answer that question today, truthfully, the answer is yes, we have. What do you mean, Pastor Mike? Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a computer in your home? Do you have an iPhone or a phone that can get internet access? Do you have a television in your home? Then things are entering into your home. Other things you can bring in, but the, the, here, here's things that, and, and we need to be uh, protecting. We need to be aware of these things. And we need to keep the light on. And we need to, to train our kids and, and not be afraid to tell them, you know, ha have conversations with them about the truth of the things that, you know, are there. They know. They know better than we do. They know how to get to them faster than we do and how to find them better than we do. It's amazing. Little Brendel gets, you know, a hold of our phone and she immediately get, finds this thing that's all these instruments. I didn't even know it was on the phone. I said, how did she find this? And she's playing guitars and piano and all the drums. And I'm like, where, where is this on my phone? I, have, I still have no clue where it is on my phone. But she can go there in a second. She's two years old. It's amazing, isn't it? But, you know, we... We want to impart truth to our children because they're going to, you know, again, you know, scarier than getting in the car is just the fact that the world is going to come against them. And they're going to they're going to have temptations that they have to deal with. And we're going to have to trust God. We're going to have to learn how to trust God. And the best way for us to trust him fully is is by doing our job. I mean, you know, there, there are no guarantees. If we, if we train our children perfectly, does that mean that for 100% for sure they're going to always follow the Lord and never, never go off on their own? No, there are no guarantees. But I, I do guarantee this, that if you teach them the things of God, they will never leave them. Wherever they go, they will be there. They will never forget them. And even in the midst of their rebellion, they will know. They will know. And, and you know what God will be doing through all of that? Drawing them back. Drawing them back. You know, I thank God for, you know, praying wife and a praying family. But when someone goes astray, it's... I'm, I'm trusting God that the things that I implanted, you know, not to do this to you, Joel, but when Joel went his own way, that's what we were trusting God in. And, that, and it worked. God in his life is what made the difference. And that's why he serves the Lord so powerfully today. Not, not, not even so much because of mom and dad, but because, well, yeah, because we implanted in him. We implanted in our sons these things. A parent's heart, it's the third thing. A parent's heart. It's so important. You know, the way, that we, the way that we deal with our children. You know, one of the things that I always did with my sons is I always treated them as equals in, in certain respects. Of course, you know what I mean by that. In other words, I didn't, you know, treat them like they were just little kids that, you know, they couldn't understand anything. I was reading uh, in, in Francis Chan's latest book, Letters to the Church. Again, don't get that book. It's... If you do, you'll be in trouble. It's a powerful book. And in one of the last chapters, he's talking in there about children and how, you know, is God a respecter of persons per se? In other words, if, if, if a child has the spirit of God in him, can that child know God? Can that child hear from God? Can that child, you know, speak into someone else's life? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. You know, last week we had a, a teenager give a word from the Lord. Right here in this church. And I know that it spoke to several people. I know for a fact. Because at least one of them came and talked to me. But, you know, it's amazing. You know, uh, God, God wants to use us and he wants to use our kids. And when we pour into our kids, you know, I, re I remember all the conventions we used to go to. And the way the Lord would minister and the way our kids would be up there at the altar. It's powerful. And he was, you know, that, I, that's why they're in the ministry today. That's what's so powerful about these youth retreats. 
because it gives the Lord an opportunity to really speak to our kids. And, and, uh, and they, they need that place. They need a place where God was. That's what's so powerful about our worship nights. Our next one is March 25th, by the way. I can't wait for that. But what an awesome night it was, you know, when we were here in January. It was the last Monday in January. Just a moving night where, where we spend time around the altar and God ministers to us. God ministers his love. All right, what was I at again? A parent's heart. Uh, uh, one of the, a pastor wrote about the ordeal of, of giving his son the car keys for the first time. He said, how strange. He said, I did it because I loved him. And I didn't, because, no, 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 no. He says, how strange. Because I loved him, I didn't want to let him go. But because I loved him, I celebrated his freedom with him. Love and logic are indeed strange bedfellows. And he says, today I also learned something new about my father. He said, like all fathers, he surely must have struggled with the urge to restrict my freedom and maintain protective control over my life. But he didn't. Instead, he celebrated my right to choose, even at the risk of being wrong sometimes. And that's, that's the hard part about parenting. But I just wanted to read a couple of verses of Scripture. I wanted to read Psalm 103, verse 13. Sorry, I'm skipping some here. It says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. But the point that I'm pointing out there is, is about a father, you know. The Lord has put a measure of compassion in our hearts. And he wants us to be compassionate with our children. I love what 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 and 8 says, where Paul is talking. He says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her children. Uh, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. I love the way the NIV says it there, but our very lives as well. It says, because we had, you had become so very dear to us. And this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to share. He wants us to give our very lives, pour our very lives into our children. A father has compassion on his son. A mother, uh, gentle like a mother, taking care, nursing her children. Or then again, a few verses later in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12, where he says, For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So we, like a father with his children, what we exhorted each one of you and encouraged each one of you and charged you to, to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And then Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 6 and 9 through 11, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when, he, when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. We can't be afraid to discipline our children uh, because we're proving that we love them. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And then it goes on and says this. Besides this, this is now in verse 9. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good. And this is the thing about discipline, you know. Uh, the, the discipline that I would give my boys when they were younger, the discipline that we give our children, the discipline that God gives to us is what? Is for our good. That we may share his holiness. I just thought that's so powerful. It's for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment of, of discipline, or for the moment, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. And that's why sometimes we shirk from it ourselves as parents, don't we? It, and it's hard. It's hard to be consistent, isn't it? Man, it is hard. It's a lot of work. But it pays off. It pays off. But later it yields what? The, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Even though it, it seems painful at the moment, it yields the fruit of righteousness. And, and uh, it's just, it's such a necessary thing uh, in the family. 
And, and this is part of the parent's heart. And here's the other thing, too, that we want to instill in our children. And Acts 1.8 says this. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And I just think it's so important for, for us to, to remember that it's by the Spirit of God that the real difference can be made. You know, teaching our children uh, to walk in the Spirit makes all the difference in the world. Letting them know that God can speak to them. Teaching them to be in the Word of God. Uh, teaching them to, to, to praise the Lord God. You know, we always had our boys at the altar when we could so that we could teach them not to be afraid, to, to lift up their hands to the Lord, to worship the Lord, to be led by the Spirit of God. So, you know, I, I've always just, you know, when I first got saved, as you know, I, I, I really wasn't a big worshiper in the Lord. I, uh, I was afraid of it all. You know, kind of like that word that came forth today. I was afraid. You know, for my first time in a, in, a, in a church like this, you know the story, most of you. When I saw drums in the church, I was shocked. Drums and guitar and keyboard. and What kind of a church is this? And I just... And I was in the service, and I was just telling the Lord, Lord, I can't do this. I can't clap in church. I can't sing out loud. I can't do this, God. And the, the service was stopped uh, with a message, a message in tongues. Some of us don't believe in that, but <laughs> this is what happened in my life. And then an interpretation came saying, do not say, I cannot do this. And I just fell in my chair, floored that God had spoken to me. And that's, that's the thing, you know, don't be, a, don't be afraid. Don't say, I can't do this. You know, it's funny, the other day I was, found myself saying, because I'm one of those half, half full guys instead of half empty. I don't, which, wait, what is it, how does that go? Uh, the glass is half full instead of half empty. No, no, I'm the half empty guy. Who's the pessimist? That's me. Okay. Someone pray for me, please. <laughs> I found myself just the other day saying something. Lord, I can't do this. And the Lord brought me back to that word. And he said to me, do you think that that word was just for when you were 19 years old? Yeah, I spoke that to you back when you were 19 years old, but do you think it was just for then? No. No, it's for today. That word is never, le that, I, I, didn't, I didn't give that word just for one day, now it's gone. No, that word was for you for all time. And so I said, okay, Lord, I can do this. Thank you. Help me. Help me, I need your help. Parents, we can do this. We can raise, you know what, you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to raise up an army for him. He wants us to raise up an army for him. We are, again, I, I, we are in a battle. <clears throat> and and the, the young generation, the younger generation, they are very vulnerable. And we need to be fighting for them. And parents, we need to be fighting for our children. Dads, we need to be, we need to be keeping the light on. For our children. And here's the promise of God. The promise of God is, is that if you do these things, if you purpose in your heart, like Pastor Sam told us yesterday at the, the uh, sweetheart dinner, to purpose in our hearts. He talked about having a marriage mission statement. And he gave us questions to answer. And he says, now fill all these out and take them home and then talk to them together, husband and wife. And and, and, and get together a mission statement for your marriage. In other words, you know, be intentional with it. If, we, if we're intentional with this, parents, moms and dads, and, and, and if we're intentional with this, God has given us promises. Very great and, promise, very great and precious promises. And he said, he will never leave us. You will never be alone. 
you will never be alone. And, and going back to that first worship night that we had in January, which what a great night it was. The Lord spoke to us. The Lord gave us a word. And that, that word was Psalm 91. And I want to close with that today. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up right now. And listen to what Psalm 91 says. It's just so powerful. It's for, you know, we were, we were told that night that this, this psalm is for Edgewood Baptist Church in 19, 2019. How, how many brain mistakes have I made now? So that's another thing. See, some of us are so afraid to pray out loud or to speak sometime in public because we're afraid to make a mistake. And look how many mistakes I've made today. And I think you all still love me. Thank you. So don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't be afraid. It's okay. Here's the promise of God. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. You know what that word dwell means? It means lives. Lives there. Live in the shelter of the Most High. You know what did Deuteronomy say? Talk about these things when you walk by the road, you know, when you sit down, when you rise up, when you're in your house, when you lie down. Make the most high your, your dwelling place. That's what he's saying. He who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That means he, he will never leave you. His shadow will always be around you. He will always be there to protect you. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And what will he do? He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. That means feathers. Because he's like an eagle here. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you'll find refuge. I was reading through the book of Ruth uh, this week and it talked about how Boaz said that. I've been told about how you left your country and came to be with, you know, with Naomi. And you've come under the wings of the Almighty. I just thought that was so beautiful. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. Buckler is just a small shield. It's the one you hold on your arm. Two shields there. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Notice he doesn't say there won't be terror by night, but you won't fear it. Because he's going to be your shadow. He's going to be your protector. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. Listen, but it will not come near you. Make the most high the place where you live. Dwell there. He says, you will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, there it is, the most high who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. Hold on to this. The prerequisite is making the most high your dwelling place. Live there. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. We just talked about someone who let a snake in the house, right? You don't have to be afraid because you will tread on them. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Even if you did accidentally let something in, you'll get victory over it. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Wow. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. We sang it this morning. It's part of the bridge, and we're going to get there in a minute. 
But if Jesus Christ is the king of your heart, then I guarantee you that he's never going to let you down. He's never going to let you down. If you purpose in your heart to be that one who will teach diligently to your children the words of God, the things of God, that you shall talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, that if you will make the most high your dwelling place, my God is never going to let you down. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. And I'll come back with the benediction. Be yeah.